Today, I'm going to be talking about science and stereotypes. <laughs> and to start off, I have a question for you. Who is a scientist? Now, when I ask this question, a common figure normally comes to mind, who looks a lot like this. <laughs> now, if these figures are looking familiar, then you are not alone. <laughs> a lot of kids would agree with you. In 2000, researchers at Fermilab, a particle physics laboratory in Illinois, asked seventh graders, what is your perception of this ubiquitous nerd overlord? What they found was that if you ask seventh graders to draw their response to who is a scientist, they will draw an old white guy who plays with chemicals indoors by himself. <laughs> So it doesn't really take an Einstein to see that science has a bit of an image problem. In media, science is not portrayed as a career or a calling. It is portrayed as a person. You know him well. His name is The Scientist, and he occupies a starring role in movies and TV shows like The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> he is the owner of a gloomy attitude and an imposing lab coat. The awkward but kind of adorable nerd. And based on these common themes of what we've seen so far, I think we can give it a go and synthesize our own stereotypical scientist using what I dubbed the Build a Brainiac Equation, an equation which neatly summarizes some of the trends <laughs> we've been seeing thus far. <laughs> Social awkwardness plus unruly hair plus lab coat yields the scientist. <laughs> Sound familiar? But if you had asked five-year-old me who was a scientist, I would have drawn a very different picture. As the child of two scientists, I had actually a horrifyingly human peek into what a scientist can be like. <laughs> to me, scientists didn't spend their days in the lab wearing a lab coat. They would spend time outside in the garden with family and friends. Although they were in the lab, they didn't live the lab rat stereotype 24-7. As a result, what I saw and learned from this was that science was the way to change the world. And by ninth grade, I knew I wanted in. My first step into science took the form of a question. How can I tell if a lettuce plant will be red or green? Red plants, lettuce among them, pack a serious antioxidant punch thanks to a very special plant pigment called anthocyanin. Anthocyanin, which is shown in the red leaf color here, can help offset the effects of malnutrition. Today, in a world where 795 million people worldwide are affected by food insecurity and malnutrition, red vegetables have a very important and prominent place in resolving that issue. Alternative solutions like GMOs do exist, but they face a lot of international scrutiny. In order to improve the quality of our diets, food needs to be revised from the farm up. In order to solve this urgent problem, I took a look at a different type of agriculture called traditional breeding. Traditional breeding has several distinct advantages, the first being that it does not carry the stigma of GMOs, and that it is a sustainable and diversified way to feed the world. However, like all solutions, traditional breeding is not without its own set of disadvantages. Specifically, it being that it takes 10 years to go from a seed to a plant that you can sell in the market. This is not feasible. In order to be able to cater to increasing global nutritive and consumer demands, we need to make better plants faster. So, how do we make better plants faster? Well, based on my experience, which really was getting at the core of this question as to how to make traditional breeding a more sustainable agricultural model, all you really need is the revised Build a Brainiac equation. Creativity plus grit plus growth mindset yields science. One of my favorite parts of being a teen scientist is not only do I get to relentlessly churn out ideas and ask fun questions, I also get to be creative. Creativity is important because it's celebrating uncertainty through play. In a scientist's toolbox, creativity is an essential element because it allows you to think in off-the-wall, non-linear ways. For example, in my own research, just the setup of my experiment was pretty off-the-wall. I used something called a PCR microplate, a plastic plate which is normally supposed to be completely sterile with nothing growing in it. 
For my experiment, I turned that idea on its head a little bit. I took the microplate and I would put seeds in it and I would have lettuce plants growing, along with a host of molecular mischief makers like fungi and bacteria. However, this wasn't the only time when I veered away from the lab standard. In order to get these plants to grow, I had to modify the microplate. I took a nail clipper from home and I punched off the bottoms of the wells. After that, I added the seeds and I would nest the modified microplate on top of an unmodified microplate. With my nested microplate made, I now needed a way to grow the seeds, but plant growth chambers cost thousands of dollars I simply did not have. In order to ensure that the plants would be able to grow successfully, I took a plastic zipper bag, I put the nested microplate in the bag, and I let them grow as a mini greenhouse in that way, instead of investing thousands of dollars in equipment I simply couldn't afford. Without creativity, the leap from using PCR microplates as a means to analyze samples to using them as a means to make a mini greenhouse would not have been possible. Grit is also a very important element in science, because in science, it basically means skill times effort squared. Grit makes a difference because science can get pretty brutal. In fact, I would say the type of grit you encounter in a research lab is not that far removed from the type of grit you would encounter in a spaghetti western. <laughs> Although you'll find more scientists troubleshooting than sharpshooting, Basic daily lab procedures require the same amount of high-level intensity and mental resilience. In my personal experience, just designing the nested microplate model took a year, and then two years later, still tweaking and still improving. At times, the pace of my research was torturous. The obstacles seemed never-ending. The first time I tried to actually grow the plants in the microplate, they all died. <laughs> Before the seeds could germinate, the water had evaporated from the lower wells, resulting in a plate of dead plants. Not to be deterred, I had to readjust my approach. Instead of using water, I used a gel that wouldn't evaporate. However, after that roadblock was solved, I had another hurdle in my path. I had to find a way to actually track down the genes responsible for red leaf color in lettuce, responsible for anthocyanin. When I looked in the database, however, the data that should be there was not there. The sequences were nowhere to be found. In order to actually get access to the sequences, I had to do a lot of molecular footwork that normally would not have been required and took a lot longer than normal. Although I could have been discouraged by this, I chose to, to find it as a way instead to hone my grit and my mental resilience and intensity. This rigorous process would sometimes leave me feeling like I wanted to give up, would sometimes make me feel like I wasn't in control of the experiment, but sometimes, some very rare sometimes, I found the answer I needed to keep coming back to the lab. This intense process instilled in me an appreciation for stick to and self-control. Through this process, I learned that grit was the key instrument that allowed me to turn an idea into something actionable that can affect change in other people's lives. However, grit isn't alone to this. A growth mindset is also very important in science. A growth mindset can be defined as exponential opportunity. It makes a difference because, well, no one knows everything. For an allegedly intelligent species, we don't know a heck of a lot about why we're here. At the lab where I work through a high school internship program, the Baruch S. Bloomberg Institute, I am in a crowd of people who are all experiencing the same battle, constantly dancing along the edge of uncertainty, where there are plenty of questions, not a lot of answers. As you can imagine, this makes for a great conversation starter. I treasure the conversations I have with innovative minds from all ages and all backgrounds. For example, two weeks ago, I was encountering a lot of problems more than normal with my nested microplate model. I just didn't know if the cells I wanted were shedding, and if I couldn't obtain DNA using the model, well, the entire point was moot. All the work I had done would have been for nothing. When I shared my troubles with a researcher, he showed me how to use a fluorescence microscope, something that would allow me to tag the cells and then visually verify if their presence was there or not. <coughs> Through his help, I was then able to continue my research to increase the concentration of DNA in the wells and to make my research easier to replicate by other scientists. The creative processes that you see in the lab made an excellent incubator for my ideas as a teen who is very familiar with the idea of empty creativity, 
of having ideas, but not enough money or mentorship to see that idea through, the resources and openness of the lab makes it feel like an oasis to me. Every day, I go into the lab taking comfort in the fact that the story of scientific inquiry is never-ending, and I will always be able to refresh, renew, and retool. In my research, a growth mindset made a difference because it allowed me to find truth when there was no pre-existing roadmap. Throughout my time, either at home, at school, or in the lab, three key qualities gave me the inspiration and direction to find my passion in science. Creativity, grit, and a growth mindset. As modeled by my parents, my peers, my teachers, and my lab colleagues, these key traits allow me to see science as more than just the scientist. In fact, over the course of my lifetime, science has rapidly increased its inclusivity and its diversity. Between 1970 and present, the proportion of female STEM workers has increased from 14 to 41 percent nationally, and for non-white STEM workers, it has increased by 23 percent. At the Baruch S. Bloomberg Institute, where I work, 42 percent of the researchers are female, and 55 percent of the researchers are non-white. When we defy these stereotypes that limit our ability to innovate and to think creatively, we open up our limitless scientific potential. The time to retire the scientist is now. Although more work needs to be done to engage and enable minorities in science, the new and changing face of scientific inquiry is united by three common denominators, creativity, grit, and a growth mindset. <laughs>